and welcome to the EMS On Air podcast. The mission of this podcast is to keep healthcare providers safe, informed, and prepared. Today is October 19, 2020. I'm Jeff Lasters, and I'll be your host. Last week, we were joined by my good buddy, Dr. Steve McGraw, who is an ED physician at Ascension Providence Hospitals in both Southfield and Novi, Michigan. Doc is also the current Oakland County Medical Control Authority EMS Medical Director. The OCMCA provides EMS oversight to 54 EMS agencies within Oakland County, Michigan. Even though we are located in southeast Michigan and we mention our home state a lot, most of the EMS on-air content applies to EMS on the national and even the global scale. Dr. McGraw gave us a clear picture of what is at stake for stroke patients. He and I also talked about the evolution of treatments available to stroke patients, as well as the evolution of EMS stroke assessment in the field for over the last 40 years or so. Over the last decade, tremendous advancements have been made in the amazing world of endovascular therapy for acute ischemic stroke patients. Endo, meaning within, and vascular, referring to the blood vessels. When treating certain types of ischemic stroke, EVT involves advancing a catheter within the affected artery to the site of an occlusion. Mechanical thrombectomy is just one type of EVT. Specifically, mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever has been established as the standard of care for select patients suffering from large vessel occlusion, or LVO stroke. As a result, early recognition of LVO stroke in the pre-hospital setting has become a priority for EMS systems around the world. Consequently, a seemingly ever-growing variety of stroke severity scales continue to emerge. Stroke severity scales are designed to identify LVO stroke patients who may be candidates for mechanical thrombectomy. Right now, there are many EMS systems across the nation effectively using stroke severity scales to measure stroke and obtain targeted pieces of information about the patient, all in an effort to get them to the best possible treatment in the quickest and safest manner. These days, EMS has a lot of stroke severity scales to choose from. There's RACE, VAN, CPSS, PASS, LAMS, FAST-ED. You get it. The list goes on. Since about 2015, I have personally learned about a dozen or so in a fair amount of detail. Most of them are fairly similar and use elements of the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, or NIHSS. The NIHSS is the gold standard of measuring stroke in a hospital, so it makes sense to start there and identify the key components that can best be leveraged by EMS in the field. The stroke severity scale I'm most familiar with is FAST-ED. FAST-ED is actually a double acronym. The first is the Field Assessment Stroke Triage for Emergency Destination, which nicely conveys its intent and purpose. FAST-ED acronym number two was designed to help remember the steps of the scale. These are face, arms, speech, time, eye deviation, and denial neglect. Each assessment step of FAST-ED is scored based on specific criteria. Once the assessment steps of FAST-ED are completed, the EMS provider adds up a final score, which can range from 0 to 9. A FAST-ED score of 4 or greater indicates a high probability of LVO stroke, or at least the presence of a severe stroke. Many EMS agencies that use FAST-ED also utilize a paper or digital checklist to assist with completing and scoring the steps. Some EMS systems are even working directly with their patient charting software vendors to make it easier to provide their FAST-ED findings to the ED within the EPCR. What I like best about FAST-ED is that it incorporates both a stroke screening tool and a stroke severity scale into one assessment. In my opinion, this allows for a streamlined assessment of potential stroke patients. The other thing I like about it is that it uses the same terminology as the hospital. I've personally witnessed an increased connection between EMS and the ED when communicating about strokes when using FAST-ED and its terminology. If you or your EMS agency need to catch up on your stroke knowledge, go on over to AmericanCME.com. There, you'll find multiple courses approved for EMS continuing education credits that focus on stroke. I highly recommend the course, Identifying Large Vessel Occlusion Strokes with FAST-ED. This course walks you through the FAST-ED Stroke Severity Scale step-by-step, shows you how to score the criteria of the scale, and provides additional details to successfully guide EMS through the process. Or, if you want to focus on the fundamentals, check out the course Anatomy and Pathophysiology of Stroke, which breaks down each region of the brain. Or check out the course Large Vessel Occlusion Stroke, which introduces EMS to LVO and provides great detail and information. 
All three of these courses are approved for 0.5 EMS continuing education credits in the medical category. Did I mention that you can access all of American CME's content for free? Yeah, free. In this episode, we provide you with an example of an EMS system using FASTED to evolve their stroke system of care. The OCMCA Stroke Systems of Care Special Study is designed to evaluate EMS's ability to measure stroke severity using FASTED. I'll provide you with a nice clean overview of the study, who's currently in it, how to get involved, and even more. This study is rapidly expanding. If you'd like to know more information about the OCMCA Stroke Study, or if your agency or hospital would like to participate, visit ocmca.org stroke. There, you'll find all the information you need about the study and how your EMS agency or hospital can participate. You'll even find study data, as well as a few presentations that you can download. You don't have to be located in Michigan to participate. The OCMCA would love participants from all over the U.S. to help us identify the strengths and weaknesses of implementing a stroke severity scale so that we can share the knowledge amongst the entire pre-hospital community. As a quick little side note, you're likely familiar with the drug TPA. In the recent year or so, I've been told that we should start referring to TPA as Altaplace. So when you hear me say Altaplace during this podcast, please know I'm referring to TPA. Consider it synonymous. Please keep emailing your questions, comments, feedback, and episode ideas to the EMS On Air podcast at qi at ocmca.org. Also, check out our updated website, emsonair.com. For the latest information, podcast episodes, and other details, follow us on Instagram at EMS On Air. And please, whatever podcast platform you use, subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us to grow the podcast. Enjoy the episode. Let's start a discussion with an overview of large vessel occlusion or LVO stroke. Ischemic strokes are the most common form of stroke and are due to either a thrombus or embolus that obstructs blood flow to the brain. The severity of the stroke and its signs and symptoms tend to depend on the cerebral arteries that are involved. A transient ischemic attack, or TIA, is due to a temporary obstruction in blood flow to part of the brain that resolves on its own without any resulting neurological injury. A small vessel stroke is a stroke that involves any of the small terminal artery branches of the brain. A small vessel stroke tends to be limited to a single isolated area. A large vessel occlusion stroke, or LVO, is a stroke that involves any of the large primary arteries of the brain. Due to the involvement of the larger cerebral blood vessels, multiple cortical areas tend to be involved, resulting in a stroke that tends to be present with more severe deficits. Again, an LVO is a kind of ischemic stroke that affects any of the primary arteries of the brain. This includes the internal carotid arteries, middle cerebral arteries, anterior cerebral arteries, the basilar artery, and the posterior cerebral arteries. During an LVO, the obstruction of cerebral blood flow is more severe due to the involvement of the large cerebral arteries. Greater declines in cerebral blood flow correlate with more extensive regions of ischemia and increased brain tissue death. In fact, one prospective study showed the presence of an LVO was associated with a five-fold increase in death and a three-fold decrease in good outcomes. Even more alarming is the prevalence of LVO stroke. That same study also showed that nearly half of all enrolled stroke patients suffered from LVOs. Not only are the stakes much higher for stroke patients with large vessel occlusions, but also standard thrombolytic treatment is typically ineffective. The likelihood of Altaplace clearing a clot decreases as the size of the clot increases. The stroke chain of survival has grown stronger for LVO stroke patients thanks to the advent of interventional devices used to perform mechanical thrombectomy, or MT, which is the physical removal of a clot. Mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever involves inserting an intravascular catheter into the femoral artery of the patient and extending the catheter up into the vasculature of the patient's brain. The neurointerventionalist can observe the location of the catheter relative to the clot with the use of direct fluoroscopy. A stent retriever is then deployed into the clot, immediately restoring distal blood flow to the affected region of the brain. 
The American Heart Association, American Stroke Association stroke guidelines recommend optimizing in-hospital care for LVO ischemic stroke patients by utilizing a broad strategy that incorporates intravenous altiplase, advanced imagery of the brain, and mechanical thrombectomy with stent retrievers when indicated. Up until relatively recently, the reality of stroke treatment offered few proven answers for victims of LVO stroke. If LVO stroke patients survived, they were often condemned to a lifelong severe disability. Mechanical thrombectomy's proven effectiveness now offers reliable options to patients who had none just a few short years ago. Now that you have some context regarding LVO strokes, let's get into a little history of how this study got started by providing an overview of the OCMCA Stroke Special Study. In 2017, the OCMCA began to consider the future of stroke care for EMS in Oakland County, Michigan. During that time, the Oakland County Med Control analyzed the adequacy of our EMS stroke protocol as well as our current stroke cases. The information that was gleaned led the OCMCA to consider if our stroke system was ready to adopt a stroke severity scale. After careful consideration, the OCMCA chose to design a special study that would determine if EMS can identify candidates for mechanical thrombectomy with a reasonable degree of accuracy, utilizing a pre-hospital stroke severity scale. To accomplish this, the OCMCA, along with a neuroexpert subcommittee, convened to identify the most appropriate stroke severity scale, develop a stroke special study EMS protocol, identify and develop education requirements and resources, and develop a quality assurance quality improvement case study process. The American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline Stroke Severity-Based Triage Algorithm for EMS was released in March of 2017 in response to the overwhelming evidence that confirmed the effectiveness of mechanical thrombectomy for select LVO stroke patients. In this algorithm, the American Heart Association recommends the use of a stroke screening tool to screen patients for positive signs of stroke when indicated. Then, if positive signs of stroke are identified, the algorithm recommends the use of a validated stroke severity scale in order to estimate the severity of the stroke and predict the likelihood of an LVO. Stroke screening tools were designed specifically for use by EMS to detect signs and symptoms of stroke in the field. They are simple to use and have a good sensitivity for detecting the most common types of stroke. These scales were developed to enable EMS to identify patients who may be candidates for IV alteplase and allow for triage and early notification to the nearest designated stroke center. In contrast, stroke severity scales have been designed to objectively identify the severity of a stroke and recognize reliable indicators of LVO stroke. Stroke severity scales enable EMS providers to identify LVO stroke patients that may be candidates for MT. Pre-hospital recognition of LVO stroke has the potential to reduce time to definitive treatment for LVO stroke patients. There are many versions of stroke severity scales, however, they can generally be divided into two categories. Scoring-based severity scales, which utilize a score to predict an LVO with the use of a scoring matrix that rates the severity of a stroke, signs, and symptoms. And criteria-based scales that utilize specific criteria to predict LVO stroke without assigning a score. Remember, prior to utilizing a stroke severity scale, a simple stroke screen should be performed first to identify the presence of signs and symptoms of stroke. If signs and symptoms of stroke are detected, an EMS system should utilize the stroke severity scale that best matches their local needs and conditions. Currently, there are a lot of stroke severity scales to choose from. After careful consideration, the Oakland County Med Control, along with their recommendations from their Neuro Expert Subcommittee, chose to use the FAST ED Stroke Severity Scale in the study. The study began January 1, 2018. Two Oakland County Med Control Authority hospitals volunteered to participate in the first phase of this special study, which included St. Joseph Mercy Oakland and Beaumont Hospital Royal Oak. Mechanical thrombectomy is available 24-7 at each of these hospitals. The Bloomfield Township Fire Department was the only EMS agency participating in Phase 1. Each of the 70 firefighter paramedics received a total of six hours of training for this special study. All future EMS providers in the study will not have to endure all six hours of live training. Since then, we've streamlined the education process, which you'll hear about later. 
For reference, Bloomfield Township is about a 25-minute drive to downtown Detroit, which is in Wayne County, just south of Oakland County. Per the OCMCA transportation protocol, all stroke patients with an onset of less than 24 hours will be transported to the closest stroke center to the location of the incident. From any point in Bloomfield Township, St. Joseph Mercy and Beaumont are the two closest stroke centers. Again, both provide mechanical thrombectomy 24-7. Phase 1 of the study included two years and thus far has yielded 81 cases. All patients that received a primary impression of stroke or TIA by EMS are included in the study. If interested, you can go to ocmca.org slash stroke to download and review the 2018 and 2019 annual reports to the State of Michigan Quality Assurance Task Force. These reports include outcome data, details, and other information related to the study. After the first two years, the OCMCA decided it was time to expand the study and achieve a higher number of stroke cases to include in the study. To accomplish this, so far, three hospitals and six fire-based EMS agencies have agreed to complete all of the necessary training and logistics and then be added to the study. Originally, Phase 2 was supposed to begin April 1, 2020, but the COVID-19 pandemic happened and caused a huge delay, among other logistical problems. Now, it has been identified that it works best for everyone involved to approve all Phase 2 participants to go live after they have completed all necessary training and logistics. The EMS providers working the road will be required to complete four modules on AmericanCME.com. These include anatomy and pathophysiology of stroke, stroke center levels of care, large vessel occlusion stroke, and finally, identifying LVO strokes with fast ED. All content found on AmericanCME.com is available for free. You can go to their website or contact them directly by email at AmericanCME at AmericanCME.com. They also offer agency accounts that will make it super easy to track the education completement by all of your EMS providers at one agency. I highly recommend this for any EMS agency that will participate in this study. Any participating EMS agency must commit personnel to complete the Oakland County Med Control Authority Stroke Study Fast ED Train the Trainer module. Then, the agency instructors are responsible for completing the Fast ED practical skill education and evaluations. All details regarding the Fast ED practical skill Train the Trainer module will be provided directly from the OCMCA. Ultimately, it will be the responsibility of each EMS agency in the study to assure all personnel receive the necessary initial and ongoing training. This includes current and future EMS personnel. Although there is no formal training requirements for hospital staff, there are a few things they should be aware of. First is knowing what to expect when EMS calls in a stroke alert to your ED which will now include a fast ED score. EMS will provide a stroke alert by radio or phone to the receiving ED each time they encounter a stroke patient in the field. This will include the fast ED score along with a list of neurodeficits identified during the stroke assessment, the patient's last known well date and time, the date and time of sign and symptom discovery. They will also convey if the patient takes blood thinner medications as well as the name of the medication and the date and time of their last dose. The stroke alerts will also include relevant vital signs and an estimated time of arrival. The second thing hospital staff should be aware of is the documentation they should expect to receive from EMS each time they transport a patient with a primary impression of stroke to their ED. Participating EMS agencies have been trained to provide a copy of the FAST ED scoring checklist that was completed in the field through the receiving ED staff. EMS has been trained to complete the form entirely so that the necessary information is available to the receiving ED quickly and efficiently. It is important to know that each EMS agency has the choice of using a paper version of this form or using a digital version facilitated by their EMS charting software. Either way, the content of the form should be the same. In addition, EMS will provide an electronic copy of their patient care report or PCR to the ED. EMS personnel in the study will be trained to provide specific information for all stroke patients in their PCRs. This standard information is listed in the study EMS protocol. Again, there's no formal training for the hospital, but you should be aware of a few key things. First, participating EMS will be providing a standardized stroke alert that includes a FAST-ED score. 
Second, EMS produces that FAST ED score with the assistance of the FAST ED scoring checklist that they complete in the field each time they have a patient that they deem to have a primary impression of stroke. Again, participating EMS agencies have the choice of using the paper version of this form or using a digital version facilitated by their EMS charting software. Either way, the content of the form will be the same no matter what. And finally, EMS will provide the ED with a PCR that includes specific and standardized patient information that is designed to help the hospital quickly and efficiently treat the patient. This is usually where the show ends, but we've added a bit of content that applies to this module from another leading expert on the subject. A few months after this episode was produced, Dr. McGraw and I had the chance to interview Dr. Edward Yauk. Dr. Yauk is the Chief of System Research at the Mission Research Institute Mission Health System. He is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina, as well as an adjunct professor at the Departments of Emergency Medicine and Neurology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Yauk's experience with both neurologic emergencies and emergency medicine, along with his interest in and appreciation for EMS, MS has made him a bit of an expert in the development of stroke systems of care from the ground up. Most recently, Ed was the primary author of the 2021 Recommendations for Regional Stroke Destination Plans in Rural, Suburban, and Urban Communities from the Pre-Hospital Stroke Systems of Care Consensus Conference. In a moment, you get to hear a few segments from the EMS On Air podcast, Season 2, Episode 33, which is also available for EMS credits. I think you'll find what he has to say adds value and nuance to what Dr. Brandler discussed in today's episode. Enjoy this additional segment. Dr. Yauk, Ed, can you let everybody know who you are, what you do, and where you do it? Sure. I am an emergency medicine physician by training. I started practicing back when I finished medical school in my residency at the University of Cincinnati in 1993 and was very fortunate to get exposed to stroke at a very young age. Although I wasn't young, uh, as part of my second career, I was still formative. And I met some great people in emergency medicine and neurology who convinced me that stroke was cool and this was a great place to spend my future. So I was at the University of Cincinnati on faculty for 10 years and then went to the Medical University of South Carolina for 10 years and was the division chief and interim chair there and helped start a statewide stroke program. And three years ago, I moved to the mountains of Western North Carolina to become the chief of system research for the Mission Health System. And I've been here for these past three years. Well, it sounds like you got some expertise there, sir. Well, you know, I'm a one-trick pony, and so this is all I do, so I better be good at it. I spend a lot of time with the American Heart Association on various projects involving stroke and also education, and then I work at the various state levels directing either stroke oversight committees for, like, South Carolina, or I currently chair the EMS subcommittee on stroke here in the state of North Carolina. So this is, again, my passion and my gig. I got you there. And you also have some direct contact with EMS out there. You're pretty active in the teaching world, too, face to, well, before pre-pandemic. You're not exactly just sitting there writing papers. You're also a hands-on kind of guy, right? I try to Austin's EMS training program and work with them and did a lot of training in the pre-hospital settings for really at both at the state level, trying to create integrated training modules for them and also working with my more regional ones in stroke and also doing research in the pre-hospital setting as it relates to stroke. I wanted to get your opinion on something and help us appreciate what is at stake for stroke patients. Yeah, I think it can be boiled down to quality of life. We as emergency physicians, our goal is to have everybody survive to admission, and we rarely see what happens to these patients after they leave. And we've seen trauma patients die on our watch. We see STEMIs die on our watch. We really never see what happens to stroke patients, and they don't come in all bloody. They don't come in all screaming. They're very quiet. They sit there, and they kind of get admitted in that same state. But once you start experiencing what happens to them, especially if they aren't reperfused and the outcomes that they have and the quality of life that they no longer have, and not only the impact on that patient, but also their families and their communities, it really is devastating. And that's not something as an emergency physician I was aware of until I started getting deeper into the field. And so for me, what's at stake is being able to return a person to a good quality of life versus being dependent. And you've probably seen this, I know Steve has probably seen this, when I have gone to a patient's bedside when I'm on call for stroke and I give them the options of what we might do for them, including TPA, and even after I tell them based on the original NIN study that there was a 6.4% hemorrhage rate, almost universally the patient or their family members, when it's a large stroke, will say, 
I know my fill in the blank would never want to live this way. So it's not the fear of death that really is terrifying to them. And there was actually a really cool study looking at, you know, your aversion to an outcome. Death was an eight and a severe cognitive language or even motor deficit, people don't want to live in that, quote, vegetative state. It's not a term I like to use, but this is what our people think of. And so they will take opportunities for an improvement in their current state, even if it comes with a risk of a worse state, because what they're currently in is really bad and it's not a tenable existence that they would want for their loved ones based on what they already know about their loved ones. So for me, what's at risk for not doing this right is leaving people in a quality of life state that was potentially preventable. Help us really define, in your words, what a stroke systems of care is and how it relates to our stroke chain of survival. So I'll start a little bit more broadly. I'll just go with what is a system of care because we didn't invent it for stroke. You know, we've had it for trauma and we've certainly had it for STEMI care. So a system of care is an organized, coordinated effort in a defined geographic area that delivers the full range of care to all patients. And it's importantly, it's integrated with a local public health system. And so when I say local public health, you know, that can be at the state level, that can be at the county level, that can be within your regional group. It has to engage all the various stakeholders. And what we really want to ensure is just like what we want to do in the hospital, that this system operates cohesively, that there's a seamless transition from each phase of care. So from the 911 experience to EMS, to the hospital transition where they get brought to the emergency department, to the unit, the floor, the next place they go, or they go to another hospital. We want those transitions to occur as seamlessly as possible, as quickly as possible. And we want that team, that system of care that provided that smooth transition to have a process improvement element to this. And so we can go back and continuously improve and identify weaknesses in that system. Sometimes we can't fix it ourselves. Sometimes we have to go out and advocate for more resources. We have to advocate for money for our critical access hospitals. We have to advocate for more EMS. So a system of care, regardless of your disease state, an organized coordinated effort around a time-dependent emergency that originates in the pre-hospital community, comes to the hospital, and then requires some form of definitive intervention to prevent the long-term morbidity and mortality associated with that disease. The other thing that I tell people, and when I made the decision to pursue medicine, an old physician once told me, son, there's three things you need to know about being a doctor. You need to be available, you need to be affable, and you need to be able. And since then, we've added affordability, and we've also added accountability. So as an individual and as a system, we have to be 24-7, right? This is not nine to five. It's not, well, I, I got a golf game. I can't do this or whatever. You know, we need to be nice about it. We need to be supportive of people who are trying their best. And if it doesn't always go right, that's not their fault necessarily. This is an opportunity to learn. And hopefully we're going to be able. We all got to this point by having a certain degree of ability. And then when I say accountability, this gets back to the importance of feedback, typically positive and in a constructive way, even if something didn't go right, there's still an opportunity to improve the system without alienating people and without causing the system to suffer from disengagement because we're saying you did something wrong. So I think when you look at an individual as part of the team and when you look at the team and system in its toto, availability, affability, ability, affordability, yes, that would be nice. And again, accountability. Before I let you go, I want to talk about this really cool website you guys put together. When I say you guys, I mean the American Stroke Association. And if you go to stroke.org slash stroke transport plans, this is a really cool website. So, Dr. Yak, walk us through why it exists and what's there for our EMS systems looking for guidance. Yeah, on so topic. I think, you know, despite the white paper being, I think, a really nice document, no one's going to spend the time to read it. And again, you want to make it practical. You want the contents to be practical for people. And so, like a lot of things that are developed either from guidelines or from ACLS, we often translate it into something that is more visually appealing and also we remember things when put into these structures. So this consensus paper and others that have come out recently were kind of distilled down into this website that provides a distilled version of some of the recommendations, some of the considerations, and shows how they can be put into a system of care, starting with 911 to where they need to finally go. That was the point of having these kind of infographics like so many people now use to convey important messages.
Well, thank you. We're going to put the link in the episode description. I really recommend that you look at this website. It's really cool. It's got some fantastic resources on it, especially if your agency or system is doing any stroke education or consideration of structuring its stroke systems of care. No matter what level, if you've been doing this for five years, 10 years, or you're just getting geared up for stroke in your system, this is a really cool website to kind of check out and understand where you're at with your condition. And and Jeff, I'll add, when you see the info graphics and you see the various recommendations for the geographic regions of rural, suburban, and urban, you'll see specific time measures in there, time metrics of bypass or triage or whatever. And again, getting to our previous point, these are not meant to be absolute etched in stone prescriptive numbers. These are meant to be starting points and references for the discussion, considering the unique resources that your particular stroke system of care and your particular region happen to have. So if your number doesn't look exactly like what the infographic looks like, it's probably because you fine-tuned it and you refined it to be more applicable to your particular region. That's all for the show today, everyone. In our next episode, Dr. McGraw is back and will also be joined by David Mills, who's one of the best teammates I've ever had the pleasure of working with. In 2017, David and I were tasked with coordinating the development of the OCMCA Stroke Special Study. In the next episode, the three of us sit down to talk about what we've learned so far. In future episodes, we'll shift our attention to other stroke severity scales too. Race, Lambs, and Van seem to be gaining traction along with Fast ED. We're on the hunt to bring in experts on a variety of stroke severity scales that are being used by EMS so we can learn from their real-world experiences. So stay tuned for more great episodes. Please keep emailing your questions, comments, feedback, and episode ideas to the EMS On Air podcast team by email at qi at ocmca.org. Also, please check out our updated website, emsonair.com, for the latest information, podcast episodes, and other details. Follow us on Instagram at emsonair. And please, whatever podcast platform you use, subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us to grow the podcast. Thank you for listening to the EMS On Air podcast. Stay safe and have a great day.